Interesting. Four swords and some appears to go. Our four fingers founder go upon this continent. I'm pretty sure that's that's how it goes. Good. No, actually, they're Sixty seconds. Sixty seconds. Please secure small children. Keep your hands and feet inside the exhibit hall at all times. Flash photography is permitted within designated areas. My first visit Never ever. start a land war in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> My first visit ever to the original Disneyland was in the company of David Gerald and John Barley. Hey, Dave, are you in here? No. So if, uh, you can ask him if this is true. Just head over to his table and he'll be able to. We came to a point where we were on the, the jungle boat ride in, in, in Adventureland. You know, guys come out of the woods with blowpipes and alligators spit water at you. And, and the captain of the boat kept up a running monologue of awful puns and rotten jokes. And had no idea that David Gerald was sitting in this boat and here he is making bad puns. You, know? and you, could, you could see David steaming. And finally, when we got back to the dock from which we had left, he stood up and said, ladies and gentlemen, now you'll get to see the dark side of the forest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get started. <laughs> that was in one of your books. John Farley was barely dissuaded from tossing him over the side. <laughs> well, it's two o'clock. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Worldcon 76 Guest of Honor interview. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, My name is Stefan Herman. If you've been following our blog, Road to Worldcon 76, you may know me as Spider Stooge. <laughs> Some of you have already seen me as the person saying, no, I'm sorry, we really can't stay. We have to get to the next thing. Um, a little bit about my relationship with Spider. I've known Spider for about 30 years, give or take. And um, I would say that uh, being able to be here to help him with his Worldcon experience in place of those who could not be here today is probably the greatest honor I could have. And just a little bit of what I can do to pay this man back for what he's done for me over the years, and I'm sure for what he's done for all of you too. After all, we're all here, and we're all family. Um, so we're going to get started, and, and I know that uh, over the years there are just certain things everybody wants to know, and you know, Spider and I were talking about what would be most interesting for his fans and people interested in the process, and what it was that, you know, he always gets asked. So we thought we would take a chance and, and for this panel just really stick to the important things, the things that we know that you want to know. Um, and we try to we try to make that the reality of what we're doing with our panel. And if I if I don't eat my mic enough, just shut Eat your mic! <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let's get started. So I'd like to start off, uh, so this is this is the question number one spider. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Will you tell us exactly how to get to the bar Callahan's place in Facebook? <laughs> no. <laughs> Will you tell us, and we'll keep it in the room, what your birth name was? No. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. This has been the World Time 76 panel. We hope you had a lovely time. We'll see you real soon. Of course, we're kidding. But we fired, I figured, let's just get that out of the way because I know you all wanted me to ask. Well, let, me, let me just explain for the record that this is not because of any outstanding warrants <laughs> that I do this. I spent a summer once at Duke University while Jeannie was dancing uh, with uh, the American Dance Festival. And I went to the library and made a beeline for the card catalog and looked for Theodore Sturgeon. I felt like reading some Ted Sturgeon. And, the Duke University Library did not have one title by a Theodore Sturgeon. It was only when I got three days later, when I finally got smart enough to look for titles rather than authors, I found they had thoughtfully filed all of Ted's books under W for E. Hunter Waldo, his birth name, and thereby successfully hid them from pretty much everyone who loved them. 
And I just made up my mind I was, I was never going to let somebody do that to me. I, I hide my books by using some other alias that appeared on some other police blotter. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your criminal careers straight. <laughs> so what we're going to do here is we have a few topics we wanted to cover. The sorts of things that most people want to know about, the sorts of things that we hear a lot of questions about. We, and um, at the end, if we have time, which I'd be surprised because he tends to ramble, we will we'll see if we can take some questions. I, I can't guarantee we'll have time, but just be aware that if you still need to get your books autographed, I want to take a second to say hello. Spider will be doing autographs right after this panel, if we can find where we're supposed to be. <laughs> so, without further ado, um, I, I, just a show of hands, who read the Spider's bio in the Worldcon program book this year? Okay, so we can take certain things as being fairly common knowledge. Um, and, and discussing it, we decided to start the first part of this discussion off. We, we, we came up with a title that we're proud of, and it's called uh, Terry, Jeannie, Karma, and You. And um, so I'm glad that you folks read the bio. I gotta tell you, uh, you know, when Spider, Spider called, you know, we were chatting, getting planning for this trip, I said, nobody wants to do it. And I said, what? Want to try and get somebody to write a bio for me, and they all suddenly developed an astonishing variety of excuses why they just, even people who had previously done this for me at other conventions, I, I, no, I, don't, I don't think I could. Clearly, nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room. So, eh, do it yourself. Over with. Uh, the, the, from the Probably the first day I met Jeannie, uh, we began talking about the future, and all our plans for the future were entirely inhabited by her. Uh, we, no one in Jeannie's family has ever failed to break a hundred. And I was expecting to be out of here by about 40 because of a condition I had been born with, which caused my lungs to collapse five or six times a year. Uh, this was finally fixed for me. Uh, to my own surprise, and I have ever since been waiting for a lung to collapse again. Hasn't happened. But one day, uh, Jeannie developed a, 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 a kind of an aggravated stomach ache, and we went to the doctor. She had nothing. Uh, Jeannie's stomach ache got worse. They sent us to some specialists. The specialists had no clue what was wrong with her. In fact, they were pretty certain nothing was. But she, so we went to a second bunch of specialists, and they had, they had a, 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 a solution for, to the problem. What she was suffering from was a condition which only happened to uh, 18 to 20-year-old male IV drug users uh, during their first year of, of, of IV drug use. And uh, if you remember or have met Jeannie, I mean, she fits the profile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you see a lot of Buddhist monks who are, who are junkies. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, they brought us to a third bunch of specialists, and they had yet another completely wildly improbable diagnosis. And finally, one doctor said to us, I don't know, let me, let me open her up and find out. <laughs> what an idea, gain some data. And he, he, they had a little exploratory operation. They told me it would take about 20 minutes. And 11 and a half hours later, they, they came out of the table and they said, uh, I think we bought your wife another year. Hmm. Okay. So we changed everything about our plan for the future and you know who was in, inhabiting what roles. And our daughter came to, to live with us to help me help Jeannie make her transition. And uh, um, my daughter at that time had a brand new babe in arms. So it, it, it got a little complicated. Long story short, uh, Jeannie eventually uh, went to the Bardos and uh, was at her death, uh, at her funeral ceremony, made a, a full Buddhist priest for the first time in her life. She wanted that forever. Uh, the problem is to become a priest, you have to spend five years in the monastery and communicating with your family by occasional telephone call, and, and none of us ever felt quite ready for that one. But she, she left here as Buchi Ehe, uh, which uh, means Dancing Wisdom, Eternal Peace. Um, I like to think that please. I think that, yeah. If those of you who um, will remember her warmth and the fact that she, 
she believed in her Zen philosophy to the point where she had enough inner peace to share with the rest of us, and, and I really miss her too. So, uh, but I want to talk about uh, somebody you just mentioned. Terry? Terry. Well, Terry stayed for a little while after Jeannie checked out to help me, and was a great help, and then she and her husband moved to Ohio, where he got his first job as an electrical engineer uh, working for Honda. And about a year later, I went to visit the two of them, see their first home, you know, see how the kid was doing at age one, and uh, see how the marriage was going. And the morning of the day after I arrived, I, I woke up to find Terry uh, lying on my lap, weeping hysterically. She had just been told that she had stage four, uh, and that she was a, she was basically a dead woman walking with a one-year-old. Cheery panel, everybody. Smiles. Yeah. yeah. What can I tell you? Uh, I, I, I owe tour books, uh, the, the three books. Uh, I, I had signed to do a, a series of sequels to Variable Star. And uh, uh, then all this happened. And, and I seem to have lost the, the trick of writing fiction. I've been, I've, for the last eight, nine years, I've been putting my ass in the chair, I've been doing my part, and, and nothing happens. I, I, I look at the blank screen until beads of blood form on my forehead, and then after a while I, I, I get up and make another Irish coffee. Um, well, just recently uh, the, the machine began to, to twitch again for the first time in a long time, and I'm very afraid one of one of these going to tell Tor books about this, and they're going to demand to know where, where the hell is the first of the three books I owe them. Uh, my ability to write seems to have returned. My ability to write fiction has not. So this leaves me with only one thing that I can write about. Uh, I'm. I'm working now on a non-fiction book, which I've tentatively titled The Luckiest Man. Oh. Uh, there's, a, there's a blues guitar player named Ronnie Earl, very, very good, and he had a bass player who just died recently named Jim Meradian. And Jim Meradian was famous in the music industry because any time he ever met someone new, he would invariably say, Hi, I'm Jim Meradian, I'm the luckiest man you know, and I don't even know who you know. <laughs> well, I, I believe I can seriously make a case for being the luckiest son of a bitch that, that ever lived. Because I, uh, I knew Jeannie, and, and we had Terry, and, and I got stories, you know. It won't be any effort to, to I don't, there's no fiction required. I just tell the stuff that happened. You guys aren't going to believe some of the stuff that happened. I'll just keep, Give, give you a hint of the level of luck I'm talking about. Once when Jeannie and I had just gotten married and were just moved into our own first new home in Nova Scotia together, she got invited to come to New York and dance for the New York company. So okay, there we are in New York, first time in years for her, first time in years for me. And one day we're standing on the Wall Street subway platform at about rush hour because I was planning to buy her a wedding ring that night, which she would never gotten around to. And suddenly one or the other of us happened to glance over to our left and approximately as far away as Steph is now was standing our next door neighbor from back home in Nova Scotia. <laughs> Another dancer named John DeMarco. He had no idea we were in the city. We had no idea he was in the city. And the three of us just staring at each other <laughs> for about 10 minutes, unable to think of anything that would sound stupid in retrospect, and not wanting to be inane. But eventually, his train pulled up, and he sort of <laughs> went away. We didn't speak to each other for about another year. <laughs> Stuff like this happened around Jeannie all the time. Ridiculous luck fell out of the sky. We, we stopped at a roadside apple juice stand in Virginia once, and she met long-lost members of her family that her family had lost track of like 50 years earlier, just because she went up and said, I see you've got license plates from Massachusetts. I am from Massachusetts. And, you know, <laughs> the family split, got healed. I, it's crazy luck happened around Jeannie, and it was all good, and up until then, my luck had been distinguished by its rottenness. And, and, I, I think I can convince you guys that I'm the luckiest son bitch that ever lived. 
It's just that as Philip K. Dick famously said, everything in life is just for a while. You know, no luck lasts forever. Well, I can certainly tell you that everybody here who's uh, traveled with you these last few years, uh, we all feel pretty lucky to have been coming along with you. And I think that it's, uh, I think everybody here will join me and say that we love you and we're glad that you're here with us. Yeah. yeah. It was a bit of a close run kick. I can tell you that uh, Friday morning when we were scheduled to leave to come down here, uh, I would have given 80 20 odds this wasn't going to happen. But this man, and, and I don't say this lightly, is some kind of creature of the undead. <laughs> I was standing by his bedside and I was literally desperately afraid I was going to have to make a phone call to the con committee going, I lost the guest of honor. <laughs> no, you don't understand. <laughs> but they pumped him full of IV fluid, they slapped him on the ass, he rolled out of bed and said, eh, you know, I think we can make the ferry. <laughs> okay, Spider, you're the boss. He's not mentioning the shot they gave me was morphine. <laughs> well, I don't want to pull the curtain that's, entirely. That's good stuff, if you need it. I've never, I've never taken it when I didn't need it, so I don't know whether it's a pleasant experience on its own. But uh, <laughs> sudden absence of pain, okay. sudden absence of nausea. Uh, <laughs> don't do drugs. <laughs> he is a trained professional. <laughs> Which reminds me, by the way, D David Crosby is just about to release his fourth solo album in four years, and he's already started on the fifth one. Wow. <laughs> whoever gave him that liver gave him a great liver. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a take a second here to change topics um, because otherwise everyone's gonna just file out of here in single file and thinking deep thoughts and that's not what we're here <laughs> thinking to do. Yes, mortality. We've shared the pain, now let's bring the pain, no, let's share the joy. <laughs> uh, what I wanna talk about are the books and the work. You know, uh, coming to Worldcon as a guest of honor, it's kind of a capstone to a fantastic career. Um, you've been in lots of scrapes, you've put out a lot of great stuff, you've put out a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, Before I forget, I want to make sure and put this plug in here. I'm going to put in a plug for something that doesn't yet exist. Uh, one of Jeannie's four sisters, uh, Laurie O'Neill, is now trying to sell uh, a book uh, called Graceful Woman Warrior. Oh, yeah. uh, when Terry was having her, her troubles with breast cancer, she, uh, w when she was born, Jeannie and I named her after a woman Jeannie had met hitchhiking. Uh, a woman named Luana Mountainborn. And Jeannie just tremendously admired her, I think principally because the woman carried an enormous bowie knife and hitchhiked around yeah. the country, and <laughs> no one ever gave her any shit at all. <laughs> and Jeannie always promised that, you know, if she ever had a daughter, she'd name her Luana Mountainborn. Well, we named her that, and that worked just fine until she got to be about 11. And by then she was sick of having a name that you couldn't get a charm bracelet that said Luana, and you couldn't get a sign that said, this is Luana's room, keep out. And, and she wanted to know if she could change her name. Well, no, if you're called Spider, <laughs> and your kid wants to know if she can change her name, you really haven't got a freaking leg to stand for. <laughs> So we said, what? to what? And uh, we negotiated. I think we we, we, we turned down uh, oh we turned down several, but there's probably someone <laughs> named that in, in, in the house. So I won't. Say, but she finally settled on Terry, and we even agreed that she could spell it with an I at the end instead of the Y that got it clearly intended. But <laughs> but we got in return a signed undertaking that she would never ever under any circumstances dot the eye with a hard smile. <laughs> you gotta have standards. <laughs> well, this all went until one day she found out that she had stage four breast cancer and suddenly she saw a great value in the name Luana because it turns out that the name means graceful woman warrior. Now, at age 11, that had been the last straw. I'm not carrying this stupid name, graceful woman warrior. Who the hell would want to be 
you know, when, when, when you're fighting an enemy you know you can't beat, that, that, that's a name that suddenly seems to appeal to you a lot more. So she started a blog about what she was going through and what's involved in this dying business and what you might like to know before you get it yourself. And at the moment, uh, attempts are being made to sell that as a book. And uh, if you see a book go by called Graceful Woman Warrior, I, I read every word of that damn thing as she was writing it, as the as they were posted on, I guess it was... Yeah, well, see, I, I believe if you Google it, you can still uh, see the archive posts. It's Graceful Woman Warrior. It's a, it was that Harry's blog. Yeah. There's a Facebook yeah. page, too. Sorry. There's a Facebook page, that's right. There's Thank a you. Facebook that's page, right. That's right. But anyway, that's a comment. Thank you, Jim. Jammed. Jammed. See? I have not read a word of it since Terry originally wrote it. I, as I say, I, I followed it faithfully every day. I used to respond within five minutes of her posting stuff. But Laurie sent me the thing asking me to you know, look it over and make suggestions, maybe see if the manuscript should be arranged differently. I, I can't read it anymore. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back in another 20 years. But uh, it's, it's, it's still too close, you know, eight years later, geez. But uh, it, it's going to be a good book. I, re I remember it well enough that you will not be disappointed. Keep your eyes peeled. Graceful Woman Warrior. No idea who the publisher is. No idea who the editor is. I just know that Lori is real good at anything she puts her mind to. Uh, I'll give you a little context. Lori is Spider's sister-in-law has sort of, uh, you know, this is a great time to bring up another topic we were going to discuss. The, uh, and, and, and I think it's a nice bright spot because frankly I can see the crowd is like, okay, you're funny. Remember when you were funny, Spider? <laughs> funny, Spider. <laughs> Spider told me a great joke. you want to hear it? Sure. Okay, I'm going to tell the joke that, that we got. Two snowmen are standing in a field. First snowman looks at the other snowman and says, hey pal, you smell carrots. <laughs> so although unfortunately Jeannie and uh, Terry couldn't be with us here in physically, and I'm sure they're giving me shit for dragging this out for too long, uh, spiritually, uh, we do have one bright spot, which is thank goodness that before she went, this man is the best damn grandpa you have ever seen, okay? He spoils his granddaughter like crazy, and the reason I bring it up is because she is the reason that he's writing this new book. It's, um, she is the reason that he gets out of bed in the morning and let's make sure that she keeps motoring because she's amazing. I, I, she's, she's as musical as her mom and her grandma and as smart as her granddad and that's a pretty potent combination. And I know he wanted to talk about her so I'm gonna let him you know, just be a proud grandpa for a <laughs> The same Laurie O'Neill who is out there at the moment trying to sell Terry's book has taken it upon herself to step up. Of, of all Jeannie's sisters, she's the one whose kids all just happen to be raised, and she got nothing better to do than be, t than be Marissa's new mom. And it's so nice that she has that. But uh, I, she's recently started sending me video of, it's reached the point now where at age nine, Marissa is the one that always gets picked to be the lead in the school musical, or the class <laughs> play, or whatever. You know, and when I, when I see the video of her dancing, it, it, it almost scares the shit out of me. Uh, Jeannie had a particular philosophy of dance that nobody else I ever met had. She felt most dancers pay attention only to the, their bodies from the waist down. They're into the steps. They know all about the feet and what the legs are doing and how you die. But she didn't feel that most dancers paid enough attention to their upper body. They should be energizing their arms as well. And she developed a whole dance style of her own that was based on unification of, of body and... I, 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 I don't know how to explain it, but Marissa at age nine has the same dance style that her grandmother had. And she, she never saw Jeannie dance live. They never had a conversation. She, Jeannie was gone before she understood a word. Yet somehow, she, when she dances, it's, it's Jeannie. I, I, I know her anywhere. And you tell me, how is that done? How do you encode dance style in, in DNA? Can that be done? Or were they, in fact, engaging in telepathic information transfer, which I seem to see? 
You, know, you can send your guesses to worldconspider at gmail.com. The kid just flips me out. Now, I, I see a video of her. She's in front of a room full of people who are her classmates. They, they all know her. They know what her farts smell like. They know you know, when she's being a jerk. And, and yet, somehow, she puts on this, this face and says, come with me. I got secrets. I'll show you something. You're going to like it. And they believe her. <laughs> OK, they just immediately fall into whatever she's doing. And, and man, I just, she, she contains so much of Jeannie and of her own mom that I, I can't wait to see her grow up. I, she, I, I just, just sent her the email in which I explained to her that she's, she's just finished being a one-ager. Uh, this, this is going to be her last year as a one-ager. She's nine. Next year, she'll be a two-ager. And that's the last step for a teenager. I, she liked that. <laughs> so the downside of uh, this being a family reunion is you actually have to listen to the stories about the family. <laughs> you won't As believe we're all related my now. Is special. <laughs> Never heard that before. Um, so let's move on because yeah, something okay. we definitely yeah let's do yeah, something a little more interesting. Well, How about sorry, science? I'm going to walk that back because that was incredibly stupid. <laughs> something a little more germane to Worldcon. How about yeah, that? How about well, let's talk variable too. star. How many people here have read Variable Star? Okay, by a show of hands, this is something I'm curious, Spider, I didn't, I didn't tell Spider I was going to do this. If you think that is it 50% or more Heinlein, raise your hand. If you think it's 50% or more Spider Robinson, raise your hand. Well, you're both wrong. I won't tell you what the percentage is, but it's pretty surprising. So Spider, I mean obviously everybody here, okay, if you don't know how much Spider and Heinlein are connected personally and professionally, raise your hand. Because I need to know how many people I've got to give the background to. Alright, once upon a time, in a naval base far away, there was a very smart man named Bob and he wrote a lot of really great books. And uh, in a place called Long Island, a small skinny boy read those books and fell in love with a genre of science fiction. And he was lucky enough to uh, meet that gentleman and form a very tight relationship with him. And after that gentleman's passing, the Grandmaster Robert A. Heinlein, who just won two more Hugos last night. <laughs> and, uh, someone in a crowd very much like this, as I recall, when they were discussing the account of this unfinished uh, Outline for a novel stood up. Oh, yeah, yeah, Spider Robinson should, uh, should, should, you know, finish that. A and that wonderful us, woman named Kate Gladstone. Who was then written into the book? And stood up and suggested that they hand me the job. I, I, I almost killed her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but she meant well, and, and it, it worked out okay. I, this is something I've wondered about all my life. Uh, way back when, early in my career, I found myself impelled to write an essay about Robert, def defending him against some of his noisier critics. And before it was published, uh, I, I got an absolutely, totally unexpected phone call at two in the morning from someone I would, I would have sworn would never phone me out of the blue. It was Harlan Ellison. Spider. <laughs> 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 Uh, it's come to my attention that you've written something about, about Robert Heinlein, and, and, it's, and it's about to be published. And, yeah, why, why? He said, well, Spider, listen to me. This is your Dutch uncle speaking to you. Just, just don't ask me why I'm telling you this or who I'm telling you this about, but there are certain people who are very unhappy with this essay, and I'm telling you, if you publish it, you will regret it for the rest of your life. I mean, I mean it. This is going to affect your career and everything in it forever. And I have no idea what the hell he was talking about. For all I know, I screwed myself. I, I, you know, maybe I could have been George R. R. Martin today. Yeah. <laughs> what do I know? He wore the wrong kind of hat. Absolutely right. I, Ever since, I've wondered if I somehow screwed myself by writing this essay, rah-rah, R-A-H. But if I did, 
And the end result was the variable star came to me. Done. I'm fine. <laughs> it's a deal. You, you can keep the fame. I, I, I got to spend time wearing Robert's you know, nightgown and, 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 and his robe, his silk robe. That, I, before I put it on, I, I, I had Jeannie pose in it. Aww. I spent quite a bit of time admiring her. I, I have Robert's hand repaired desk dictionary that uh, was given to me by his granddaughter, Amy Baxter. And, and if I ever run out of words, I got Robert Heinlein's box of words to reach him. You can't. You can't beat that. Remember I said before Jeannie and I got invited to New York once? While we were in New York, I was negotiating with Robert over the, the right to use a, a story of his in a book of mine called The Best of All Possible Worlds. Available in the and, 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 <laughs> and we were, were, were going back and forth and he wanted me to translate Anatole France and I was sending him my translation and he was commenting on it. And it was all going back and forth. And I happened to mention parenthetically at the end of a letter that Jeannie and I were having a great time in New York. We were all happy, except maybe for our daughter, Terry, who was, uh, she kind of felt she was being screwed because her birthday came while she was in New York. She had no soul in New York. So there's no one to have a birthday party with. And I said, she's, she's a little cheese, you know, with this one year she got screwed out of a birthday party. And two days later, the phone rang in our apartment in New York. How he got the number, I'll never know. My, my agent didn't know, I hadn't told him, but it was Robert Heinlein on the phone. And I, he said, you and I can talk anytime. Put your daughter on the phone. <laughs> yes, sir. I called my daughter over to the phone, and they, they talked, and they talked, and she listened and nodded, and, and then hung up the phone before I could get it. <laughs> what did he say? What did he say? He said, she, he said, tell your mommy and daddy everybody gets two birthdays, one when it says on the calendar, and one when you're with your friends. And to make goddamn sure, he said, that she got both birthday parties. <laughs> We do not say no to Admiral Bob. <laughs> he was just the kindest. Well, I, I wanted I wanted to circle back to something you mentioned just before about Variable Star, and that was Kate's cameo. And so, uh, if you read Variable Star, you know there's a ton of people there. And this is something I wrote down because I wanted to know. Uh, other than Kate, who are your favorite cameos that you wrote at the Variable Star? Oh, well, for, for sure, uh, putting the trailer park boys in there made me feel good. Uh, it's, as a Canadian TV show, some of you Americans may not know, but there are a couple of characters in Variable Star who are based on probably the stonedest Canadians who ever <laughs> Available on Netflix. Almost nothing exists of the first of the three sequels that they're supposed to one day exist. But I did manage to get far enough to create a scene with the trailer park boys in there. Didn't go anywhere, and it's probably never going to go anywhere. Don't say that, it's going to get back to tour. But pretty, pretty much everybody I love in science fiction I shuffled into Variable Star at some point or another. Thinly disguised. For the record, although we've been friends for 30 years, I am not in Variable Star. <laughs> His got cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, that, uh, I suppose I have a whole bunch of notes here. There's some really stuff I definitely want to get to. You know, let's talk about Worldcon. So, 76 years of Worldcon, you've been to quite a few. Now, Spider is lucky in that, in many ways, he was a bridge from the grandmasters, the gods, the titans of the initial ages of science fiction, and the new wave of the 60s, when newer voices, dirty, filthy, long-haired hippies like Spider were coming out, and putting out stories about things like, you know, sex, and drugs, and music, and not necessarily lantern-jawed space heroes cruising the spaceways with, you know, uh, their best girl by their side. And as a bridge, you were really lucky to have had experiences with the first generation, second generation, and now the third generation. I got some names to throw at you, and let's see what your favorite stories are. Does that sound alright? A lot of the writers I really used to love don't get talked about much anymore, you know? Uh, I don't know why not, but I, I just, I, I, I cut my teeth on people like Gordy Dixon and Larry Janifer. Does anybody remember Larry Janifer? He was, he was one of the first pros who, out of the blue, wrote me a letter that seemed to resume a conversation we'd, we 
we'd already been in the middle of, and I, I had no idea who the hell, I, I knew who the hell he was, I just had never met him, never, wouldn't have recognized him if I tripped over him, and, and he taught me most of what I know about surviving the business. Anything Ben Bova taught me was about how to get past editors, but everything else Larry Jennifer took care of. <laughs> I, I still remember when I, the news came that he had passed away in, in his sleep, and everyone was saying, isn't that wonderful that he was granted that special blessing? He got to go in his sleep, and there was no pain. And I, and I found an old letter he had sent me in which he had spoken of a, another colleague who had died in his sleep. And Larry's reaction at the time was, dying in your sleep? What a chip! <laughs> Spent the whole life preparing for the big show, and then you sleep through it? Screw that! <laughs> Wouldn't you know, the one guy I ever had for a friend who was granted that blessing <laughs> was miserable over it. Uh, the, the, who else was good in the old days? Gordy Dixon. Oh my God, the, the first. You gotta have the word Dixon. What a clock doctor. Oh, but ben Bova took me and Gordy out to, to dinner once. Uh, it wasn't a restaurant. It was a private home in New York uh, known as Maria's, and you only knew of it if you knew Maria. She didn't advertise anywhere, there was no sign, just she had a couple extra tables in the dining room. And if you showed up that night, uh, you didn't even ask what, was, what she was serving, there were no menus, you just sat down. And Maria would look at you and decide what you wanted to eat that night, <laughs> and in particular decide how much of it you wanted to eat that night. And she looked at us and decided we were all spaghetti and meatballs types, and she gave me a, what I consider a normal portion, which is about half what most people do. She gave Ben twice as much as I had, and she gave Gordy like four times as much as Ben and I combined. And each of us finished eating at the exact same moment. That was an astonishing performance I've ever seen in my life. Gordy just was, you know, Ben used to throw parties at, at, at cons, especially world cons, and Gordy would be there with his guitar, and Ted Sturgeon would show up with his guitar, and. Oh, oh, to be a fly on the on those walls again. Yeah. You know, those were the days. Gordon, Kelly Freeze, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Frank Herbert. Uh, it, there were so many gods still working when I got started. Uh, that it, it hurts sometimes to go back over the list, but but geez, there's, there's, there's always been more. They keep coming. You know, Several generations that are, are since my time that I'll be I'll be learning Who's about for the next fifty years. Uh, who else? Uh, well, for, you told me a great story, and I said, "Well, we got to save that because people that's not one I knew." And so, tell the Asimov story. I had no idea the fighter had a really, really interesting connection with Isaac Asimov because you don't usually think of the two of them together. But Isaac stepped up in a big way for Spider. I'll let him tell the story. I, I was trying to get immigrated to Canada. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted letters of recommendation from famous people, and I, I, I met Isaac through Ben Bova, and I, 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 I asked Isaac if he would write me a letter to help me get immigrated. He had no objections at all. He wrote me a wonderful letter. The first four paragraphs were exactly what I was looking for. Bullshit. <laughs> like the best bullshit I ever saw. I was having a great time. You're making me sound like I was really something. And then I got to the last paragraph, which began, of course his personal appearance is somewhat odd, and his habits are rather eccentric, but then, you know, so are mine. We, we science fiction writers were all a little weird. <laughs> no, you haven't had to deal with a bureaucrat in a long time. I, I ended up never showing the manpower and immigration that document that was almost so close to what I needed. But uh uh. Uh uh. Uh I got a question. So if it's okay, Spider. Uh, the other thing we spoke about this morning, I just want to see how interested people would be if that work, other project might go forward. What do you think? Should we talk about it a little? Just, just a tease. Why not? Go for it. You, you, I get to do it, which means so. This is this is funny. So, how many people here are familiar with uh, Callahan's Cross Time Saloon? Now, how many people here think it's a little unfair 
that Spider has played in this sandbox all by himself this whole time. <laughs> How many people in this room would be interested in a Spider Robinson edited anthology of stories in the Callahan's universe? I am pleased to say preliminary discussions are now underway. Stay tuned to Twitter. If there's any news, it'll come out on at Robinson underscore spider first. And uh, we're just really excited. Uh, let me be blunt. I'm really excited that he said, yeah, yeah, that is a hell of an idea. Yeah, let's do that. So that's, I, so I think that's, that's something I was really excited to share with everybody. And if you want to know why we haven't seen uh, any more writing until recently, you told me that Ted Sturgeon taught you an important philosophy about oh. the craft of writing. The, the, the folks in Halifax, where I used to live, asked me if I would be their, their guest of honor at their convention, Halcon. And I, thinking that this was the deal killer, said, sure, all you got to do is get Ted Sturgeon to be my postmaster. <laughs> they got him. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Well, it, it, it was a long and, and, and memorable weekend, and many anecdotes occurred that I won't go into because they take too long. But the one that still sticks in my mind was I was standing in a hallway next to Ted, and a, a fan came up and accosted him, very angry, and proceeded to read him the riot act because he, he pointed to and identified a seven-year gap in Ted's bibliography during which he had published nothing, and the man was enraged. Think of the stories we missed. Think of the stories that never got written because you decided to stop writing for seven years. And Ted said, excuse me, sir, uh, I must quarrel with your premise. Uh, I, I never stopped writing. Not for a moment. I stopped typing for seven years. <laughs> now that it's been eight years since I did any typing, I find myself thinking of that line a lot and using that excuse. I tell you, well, I, Theoretically, writing is something you do all the time and then occasionally stop and, and type off the latest news. And, uh, all right, that's, that's my excuse. I'll be leaning on that for quite a while. Now. Got a couple of more stories here that Spider wanted us to get into. And by the way, you know, when they asked us to do this panel, and Spider said, well, you know, my friend Steph has got experience in this sort of thing. Why don't you have an interview? Man, I said, I, I don't really think I need to be here. And he was a little nervous, and I, and I said, you know, I wind you up and you'll just go, as you can see. I, so I'm feeling, I feel like I need to do something to contribute. So, Spider, tell us a bit about paying it forward and specifically what, uh, what Jack Haldeman did for you to pay it forward. Oh, man. I th ben Bull was said to me, you, 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 you sold me a story for Analog Magazine. You are now a science fiction writer. You, there's a, a phenomenon you might not be aware of called fandom. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. I'd never heard of it. I, where I lived, there was nothing to, uh, to alert you to the existence of fandom. You, just, you went to the library, there were books that all had a hydrogen atom impaled by a V2. But yeah. <laughs> you never met anyone else there. <laughs> you never re returned a science fiction book at the same time as someone else. And, so I had, I had no idea fandom existed. Ben suggested I go to something called a convention. So I went to a convention, and Ben wasn't there. He, he didn't bother to come to that particular one, and I hadn't thought to like, specifically arrange to meet him there. So I found myself in this huge hotel full of very strange people. And I had the idea that maybe some of them would be interested to hear that I just sold the story to Analog. I had the idea that was that was some, might, might be a little tricky to, to arrange. Uh, but. I didn't know how to start the conversation. I felt like an asshole walking up to a total stranger and saying, hey, I just sold the story to Analog. Does that interest you at all? And I didn't know why. It gets easier the, the more you do it. There were, traditions I, <laughs> there were traditions I didn't get that everybody else but me clearly knew, and I was just as out of it as I'd ever been in my life. I didn't know what I was doing, and I was thinking, this is what I'm going to make my living doing. I don't even understand what the hell's going on here. And a total stranger uh, came up to me and said, Brother, you look really down. What's, what's wrong? And I said, Well, I explained the story. I, 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 I think I'm supposed to be here, but I, I don't know where, and I can't find my place, and everybody else seems to know what's going on, and I don't. He said, Come with me. It was Joe Haldeman's brother, Jay. 
uh, Jack, Jack C. the third, yeah. and he brought me to the Silver Suite, and he introduced me to Gardner Dozois, and to, you know, like some of the gods, Jack Dan, all <coughs> sorts of people that were just names to me, and I was in awe, and, and these guys listened to me as though I were worth talking to, and I was having a wonderful time for at least an hour, and then I left there feeling really good, ah, it's just great, maybe this won't be so bad after all. And I got to the elevators, and I heard in the distance, Spider Robinson, Spider Robinson, anybody see Spider Robinson? So I said, up uh, here. And a guy taller than me and skinnier than me came loping up and he said, hi there, I'm Ted White and uh, Jay Holland just told me you might be interested to know that I just bought your second story. Uh, <laughs> 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 Except that I forgot to mention that like five seconds before he got to me and said that, the elevator doors opened and the whole elevator people all heard <laughs> Ted White say, I just bought your second story. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I owe Jay a lot, and I never properly got to thank him because he checked out of the party himself all, all too soon after he did this for me, but he didn't have to do that. You know, it was not, it was not the end for him. And that's, that, that always makes me, that's, that's one of my first Spanish stories, you know. I, I got rescued by Joe Holloman, brother. <laughs> I have one more thing that you noted that would be fun to share, and then it's uh, it's getting on to quarter two, so let's take <coughs> ten minutes and we'll let one or two people who seem really like they can't contain themselves ask a question or two, and then we can uh, re move the party over to the autograph hall. Except you, you can't ask. <laughs> I saw that, and now you're blacklisted. Yeah. I'm so. This is a story that Spider told us on the drive down. And by the way, if you haven't checked out the blog and you want to see Spider in front of various landmarks up and down the West Coast, check it out. We had a great time. And we're kind of debating whether or not we'll do it on the way back, so stay tuned. Um, but here's an important story Spider told me, and I think it would be valuable for all of you to hear, about the story of personal branding. Spider, can you tell, tell the crowd the story of Tack Hallis? Oh, yeah. We were talking about you know, writers you used to see and don't see no more. But when, I, when I first got into business, there was a guy named Tack Hallis, or he wrote under that name. T-A-K-H-A-L-L-U-S. Happens to be Arabic for pen name. <laughs> and he, he sold a bunch of stories to Ben Bova at Analog, and Tack Hallis made a name for himself, and he got, he got nominated for a few awards, and then then somehow or other he decided that writing under a pseudonym, I don't know, maybe it was a bad, bad idea or a serious mistake or something, and he <coughs> changed back to using his birth name, which was Stephen Robinette. And he vanished. I mean, his career died. Everybody who had loved him as Tack Hallis didn't read his stories as Stephen Robinette. It wasn't, I, I, don't, I have no idea why, but if anybody out there knows what happened to the man, uh, you know, I, I, I loved his stories. I always wanted more, couldn't find them, and have no idea why not. Uh, anybody know whatever happened to Stephen Robinette? Is he maybe by any chance in the house? No, we were going to have them ask you the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, if someone can track down Tack House, get worldconspider at gmail.com. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is we'll take a few questions, and to be fair, what I'm going to do is really just pick the people who I think look nicest. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I see a couple of hands. So I'm going to ask, um, it's, uh, it's roughly 10 to, uh, probably time for maybe two or three. So we'll start with this lady over here. Why don't you come on up and you can speak into the mic and ask your question. Oh, my That's as far as it goes. Yeah, pretty much. So just speak directly into the mic. Go, so, sir. You Spider, go. you've done a lot of writing that includes polyamory. What, what is your personal philosophy of polyamory, and, and what inspired you with, with the things like Callahan's Lady and all of that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Clearly, I was influenced by Robert Heinlein. And I, 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 I experimented in those lines myself. I, read, uh, I lived in three different triads at various times, and it was difficult to say which was the more disastrous of the three. 
I, I, I spoke about this at great length with a man named Stephen Gaskin. Mm. Who, uh, Stephen created uh, two wonderful things, the longest lasting commune in American history, the farm in Summertown, Tennessee, and uh, the uh, Cannabis Cup in the Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands. <coughs> That's a, a, another little project that Stephen's I like a whole lot. <laughs> but uh, where was I going with this? Uh, you, you were talking about uh, you, why it is that you wrote so many people sort of uh, falling into various fleshy snake pits. I talked about it with Stephen because Stephen had lived in various unconventional marriage arrangements and we both came to agree that polyamorous relationships seem to work splendidly as long as you stick with even numbers. That once, once you go, he, Stephen had lived in four marriage, a six marriage, and they were great, and even in two marriage, and even that was okay. <laughs> but uh, odd numbers, we both found that when something is scarce, as Stephen said, competition for it will ensue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd all have relationships spectacular. Now, I said this to Ted Sturgeon, you know, the three is very inherently unstable, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's the good part. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, uh, why don't we take a question from the back, and we'll move back. Is there someone in the back who's got a question? No? Nope. Well, then, uh, you, who's in the third row with the curly hair. Yes, you. That's right. Get up. Come on down. <laughs> I don't have a washer and dryer, but you might luck out and go home with a new car! <laughs> a while ago I discovered I was having trouble keeping the theme music from Jeopardy in my head. <laughs> and I could not understand why. And my sister and my brother and I always watch Jeopardy together every day, because it's on at the same time in each of our different time zones. And one day I suddenly got it. it, it, it fell into my head out of the sky. The, the theme music from Jeopardy is the music from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh. <laughs> Every time I tried to fit it into my brain, it refused to file, because that, that spot was already taken by something else. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. You can't recognize the theme from Jeopardy when you're finally in it. Yeah. <laughs> and here you are, in Jeopardy. You know, I just uh, lost a little of my enthusiasm for the show. I just happened to read earlier today that Orson Scott Card is a major fan. <laughs> you know that, I'm a major uh, fan. Now I've got a fire to put out. Thank you. <laughs> a question but thank you publicly because you started something with Callahan's lady and you and I corresponded very briefly I have a picture of you and your granddaughter when she was a tiny one and I would like to make a presentation to you in front of all of these people did you bring it up for the whole class <laughs> Enough for the whole class. That's a good point. I, for those of you who didn't hear, the lady said, no, Spider brought it up for the whole class. <laughs> Let it hereby be known that for decades of merriment and terrible punishment, for twisting, tweaking, and debauching our native tongue, for writing the tales of Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, for our spirit's sake, for luring us into Lady Sally's place, whose image is our sacred operations template. The fantasy makers hereby express our appreciation and the grins and groans and the flinging of virtual glassware. We declare that Spider Robinson shall hereafter be known as an honorary fantasy maker. <gasps>
Well, unfortunately, I don't think we have enough time for another question. I would have loved to have done that, but um, Spider and is going to head over and, and sign some autographs. So if you have your books, think of that. I'd like to close off by thanking Mr. Robinson for his time. I, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. As far as I'm concerned, everybody who's in this room is part of the family. Um, I love all of you yeah. just for loving this man as much as we all do. And, um, you get out there, you have a great convention, and if you're not making merry, I will find you. I have a certain <laughs> set of skills that involves telling terrible jokes. <laughs> Thank you very much, and have a lovely afternoon.